that you are able to lighten up with me this year. Uh, last time, our main text was Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, we're going to be in Ephesians 5 today. You can go ahead and turn there if you would like to. Ephesians 5, lighten up. Who was excited last night when the, the winds started blowing, the snow started coming? Anybody? Oh, yeah. yeah? Yeah? I I take it that a lot of us have a hard time with the weather when it comes to December and we start seeing the blizzards blowing. I want to give you some wisdom while people are turning to Ephesians 5. Here's some wisdom from a donkey named Eeyore who was, uh, I don't know why you're laughing, he's a brilliant sage and a friend of Christopher Robin. And here's what Eeyore once said. (coughs) It's still snowing and freezing. However, we haven't had an earthquake lately. (laughs) That's how you brighten up, okay? Optimistic. We should be an optimistic group. We should lighten up. Why should we be optimistic? Because we know that in the end, light wins over darkness. Amen. And that light is not some general idea. We're not talking about, well, there's the light at the end of the sun. No, we're talking about a person who is Jesus. Not every religion and every God is the light. No, we're talking about Jesus, who says he is the light of the world, and he is the light that is in all of us. So we know that light wins over darkness. Jesus conquered where we never would have. Us alone, we don't bring a lot to the table, but when God shines on us, the enemy is afraid because of him and his work. That's what the enemy is afraid of. It reminds me of a poem by Billy Brewer. goes like this. Nose to nose temptation I fought when I looked at the devil he blinked. I couldn't believe I had beat the old sod and then I turned and saw God and he winked. The idea is God, when he's behind you, the enemy is afraid because God is this glorifying, this amazing supernatural being who has no failure in him. He's no darkness in him. And when he shines, the darkness really does flee. So I want to align myself more and more and more with the kingdom of light because that's the only thing that has the power to reject the kingdom of darkness. Amen? Amen. Amen. Who can be honest and say there have been seasons in your life where there was a little bit of darkness left over? Anybody? Who's ever had a time where you said, Lord, I, I, I think, kind of like David prayed, look down in the deepest place in me. I, I got some stuff I've been hiding. I need you to cast some light down there. We need to align ourselves with the kingdom of light in Jesus. God is the one who has victory. And our optimism comes through trusting in God. He makes us stand out as children of light. So we're in Ephesians 5 today. Oh, that explosion that you lit off earlier, Jeremiah. Just turn my Bible pages and get to the right page. (laughs) Just for the record, the cap hurts. Thank you. (laughs) I don't know that you're supposed to point it at people (laughs) like six feet away. Hey, if we do paintball again next year, Rick, will you? Will you? Thank you. Those of you who don't know the story, we played paintball as a church one time. And uh, at at Renee's house, and Rick assassinated me. (laughs) We were not that far away, and I was like, What kind of rage do you have built up to do this to me? (laughs) Ephesians 5, verse 1. And now he's on the board. (laughs) Which means it's my turn to punish him. (laughs) See how much you have to suffer for Christ. All right, Ephesians 5, verse 1. Here's what it says. Christ, uh, Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Let me just pause for a second. Whose translation is a little different than that? Whose translation says something like, be imitators? Of Christ. Yes, just raise your hand if, if that's it. You know what? I like your translation better. The NIV, the attempt of the NIV is to translate the idea for the idea. They want the reader to understand the big idea, and they do a great job with it. But I'm going to be honest with you. I like the way the ESV says this in many other translations. Be imitators of God. I love that idea. It's setting this standard of who am I trying to be like? I'm trying to be like Jesus. 
What is my standard? I'm not comparing myself against the person in my life who I'm like, man, they're a real failure. They call themselves a Christian? <laughs> man, what a failure. No, 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 no. We are not playing the comparison game. In the world, people are so confused about what salvation is. They think that God is in heaven, and he's got this cosmic scale, and he's like, well, you did a lot of good stuff today. Oh, pretty good, pretty good, and you cussed. Okay. God is not in heaven with a cosmic scale, looking at the people around you and saying, well, you're better than, you're better than John. I mean, <laughs> John is, <laughs> we do have a John in this room. Sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> He's not in heaven saying, you know, you're better than Preston was. He's not doing the comparison game. We should be looking to Christ about what is righteousness, what is truth, what does it mean to be good, what does it mean to be holy, what does it mean to be light. We're not comparing ourselves to other people around us. We're looking to him, and we're looking at perfection, and that keeps us humble, amen? I'm not just imitating other nice Christians or great preachers that I like. I'm looking at Jesus, and when I look into the face of Jesus, it gives me an idea of who am I as an individual? Who's, who's my identity? And it helps me imitate him the way he calls me to be instead of trying to be someone next to me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's keep going. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity or, or foolish talk or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral or impure or greedy person such as an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Now we're going to come back to that last part. Let's just pause for a second, looking at 1 through 5. I'll tell you this, in 1 through 5, uh, Paul says some things. He does not mince words there. He talks about people who are in and people who are out of the inheritance. People who are in the kingdom of God and people who are out of the kingdom of God. So I just want to point out real quick, one of the apostles who Jesus appointed by his own hand has given us clarity that there is such thing as spiritual danger. No, not everybody makes it in in the end. One time somebody comes to Jesus and they're like, hey, uh, is, is, does a lot of people get in? And Jesus tells them, no, the road is narrow. That leads to eternal life. The road that leads to destruction is wide. Over and over, the, the gospel writers, the, the, Jesus himself, the apostles, they go out of their way to let us know there is a real danger associated with rejecting the truth of Christ. So I don't want to throw that away. I, I think right now it's kind of an uncomfortable thing in the world to talk about separation from God. So Paul doesn't have any trouble saying who's in and who's out. I don't think that's my role to, to, to be sure of who's in and who's out who gets the reward and who doesn't. I trust Romans 2 and 3 that it explains that all salvation is a result of Christ's work on the cross and we put our trust in him on the cross but God is going to sort out the gray areas and that's where we can be really honest. There are some gray areas. There are people where I'm like, man, God, I know you're not saving us on the basis of like perfect theology. If that was the case, we're all going to hell. Because nobody in this room has perfect theology, including me. So I know it's not on the basis of perfect theology, but there are some questions, there are some beliefs that people have, there are some ideas that they have, and the scripture gives us no open avenue for why that would be salvation. But I have to trust God in the gray areas. So when I have a relative who, man, I, I don't, did they trust Christ? Did they not trust Christ? What was the relationship like? I don't know, and it's, it's not my role to say whether they made it in or made it out, and I'm going to trust God to be the good judge. Amen. I think the truth is we might be a little surprised in who we see in the kingdom of heaven. We might be surprised. And we're going to say, God, you let him in? And, and that guy's going to be saying, God, you let him in? No, I'm, I'm kind of I'm kidding around. I'm just saying that the scripture has made it clear that there is one way that salvation is given to mankind, and that's through Jesus. So instead of playing the game of hoping some other avenue, some other broad road will somehow get me to God, I'm going to go the sure way, which is through Christ Jesus. 
Read Romans chapter 2 and chapter 3 if you want to think about that some more. So all that being said, Paul doesn't seem to be too troubled by the idea of generally disqualifying people and establishing that by their fruits you will know them, that kind of thing. Who remembers that scripture? By your fruits you'll know them. Who does that come from? Jesus. And Paul is echoing Jesus. By their fruits you're going to know them. In verse 5, go back to verse 5 for a second, he does not mince words. He says, for this, you can be sure no immoral, impure, or greater person, uh, such person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. The point of this is that those who claim to be following Jesus among the local church, they can't be in a position of defending their sin. If I was to break this down into a really simple place, we know that we all struggle. Nobody here got saved and stopped sinning altogether. That's why the, the New Testament teaches us that you shouldn't sin, but if somebody does sin, there is an advocate with the Father. That's Jesus. So, so we can know that God is going to have mercy on us. That's great. We can be confident of this salvation we've been given. But Paul does not mince words there that people who are defending their sin, they're saying, I'm not doing anything wrong. I can keep doing this. That person is in real danger. We know that people in this generation, especially, um, I don't have a TikTok, but I see enough TikToks from like YouTube. And it's amazing how much, like who has a TikTok in here? Uh, a couple of us are like, <laughs> yeah, I guess so, uh, maybe. Uh, like on TikTok, there's, there's so much religion. Have you noticed this? There's a trend. There's so much religion talk on TikTok. And 99% of it is absolute trash. It is terrible. It's wrong. It's bad takes. It's confused people. It's people who just want views, so they say crazy things. So I've been surprised by that. And we know that people are confused. Generally, in the world right now, spiritually, people outside the teaching of the church, they're confused. They're taking little bits of religion from Uncle Tom, and then they got this thing on TikTok, and they saw a TV preacher once, and they're putting that together into this conglomerate of teaching, which... I don't know what you, that concoction is toxic, man. It's dangerous when they're just grabbing things from all over. So people are confused. And when they try to open the scripture, let's just be really sympathetic for a second. The scripture can be very confu confusing to them. Amen. Imagine you're like, I want to go after God. I'm going to read this Bible thing. And the first thing they do is open up to the book of Leviticus. And they're like, God, speak to me. Okay. If anybody has a flaky white skin, keep them out of the camp. I think that's enough for today. <laughs> They're like, I don't know what to do with this book. This is weird. How do you get spiritual life out of this? So the scripture can be confusing to them. They're not sure what it even is. They don't know what to do with that. <laughs> we have a skincare expert in here who is getting a good laugh out of that. I like that. <laughs> but that, that's, a, that's Leviticus. Read Leviticus. You would get a lot out of it, okay? Avi, that's a great book for you to start with right there. Just read Leviticus. You'd be like, I know what that is. I can diagnose that right away. But people are confused about religion. They're confused about what the scripture is. And then you have false teachers who are actually encouraging people to sin and sin sexually just to live out their truth. How many times have I heard that in the last year? Well, I'm just living out my truth. I'm just living out my truth. I'm just do, I'm, it's what's good for me. I can't think of a more narcissistic and selfish and evil phrase than I'm living out my truth. And by the way, that's not just picking on one group who has some gender, gender identity issues that they're working through, temptations that are real temptations, by the way. I'm not disqualifying them saying that their temptations are fake. I think the temptations are real. But I'm not just picking on them. You see, that idea of, well, I'm just living out my truth, that actually applies to the broader audience of the world. Because I saw a lot, of, a lot of people in the last couple years, whether they said that line or not, they were living that out. I'm just living out my truth. It's what's good for me. And it's put them at odds with the kingdom of God. Even people in the church saying, well, I'm just living out my truth. We all have no problem when we, when we see somebody like a Charles Manson. You guys remember Charles Manson? When Charles Manson says something like he's just living out his truth, nobody has trouble saying, no, that's wrong, it's bad. Suddenly, everybody's an objectivist. 
Everybody has an objective saying there, there is such thing as truth. There is such thing as goodness and rightness and righteousness. And you are not in it, Charles Manson. See, everybody suddenly is on the same page. But when somebody online or you meet somebody in the store and they, they just, well, I'm living out my truth. This is what's good for me. Suddenly we're supposed to adopt that as a, an authentic position. I can't. I can't. That doesn't make sense. God is not just happy with us when we live out our truth. The scripture is full of times when people said, I'm going to do my thing and not your thing, God. They lived out their truth. And if you haven't noticed, the scripture is full. It's a book full of human failure and God's success in spite of it. So you may want to live out your own truth, but I'm telling you, align with the king of truth. Let him transform you. Live his truth, which is an eternal truth. So I want to say again, we need to be slow and cautious when we're dealing with people who are stuck and they're confused, they're not sure about things, they've been taught poorly. I want to go slow with them because we can relate. Paul is very clear that we should not judge the unbeliever. Amen. When people don't have a relationship with Jesus, when they don't know Jesus, you have no right and no reason to judge them in their sin. Because they're just as stuck as you were. And pointing out a specific sin is not going to change their life as if they didn't know it. A lot of people know when they're in sin. What they need is Jesus. And repentance isn't just one thing. It's, it's a life that's opposed to Jesus. I repent from a life that was opposed to Jesus. I repent of a mindset that said, I'm going to serve myself before you, Lord. So repentance is not just one sin. So if somebody comes in and they're struggling with a sin, genuinely, authentically, not sure what to do about it, if somebody's having sexual uh, temptations that are real temptations, I pray that this church is a very, very good church to that person. That we're not going to hop on someone who's still trying to figure things out and say, you better get this together. You're in sin right now. No, 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 we don't judge the unbeliever. But now if somebody is, is maybe in my position or they've been in the church for 20 years and they stand up and say, you know what? I, I just want to do this. I, I want to sin. I want to I live this way. I want to live my truth. And they start to live in error and they reject the scripture. They reject the teachings of the apostles. They reject the words of Jesus. They reject the counsel of wise people around them. Now that person is living in sin. And the scripture says we should discern, we should warn, and we should also judge the fruit of that person. Every unbeliever seems to know one scripture, thou shall not judge. <laughs> Which isn't even a great translation, but most people seem to know that one, thou shall not judge. And it's true outside the church, but in the church, we're supposed to discern the fruit of people and decide, is this a healthy person? Is this somebody I should take seriously as a servant of the Lord? Are they reflecting God well, or are they are in a place where they're, they're in danger? And they're dangerous to the people around them. They're not submitted to Christ yet. The, t the scripture teaches us to be careful and cautious about those two extremes. You don't judge unbelievers, and you don't throw away believers who are in struggle. But when a believer is in struggle that turns into an open embrace of sin, warnings need to come. Save a brother from fire, the scripture says. Save them. Reach out. Be the person who cares enough for them to say, I think you're in danger. Be that person. That's not just the role of the pastor. All right. Um, let's go on to, back to verse 6. I'm going to read a little more. Verse 6. You guys doing okay today? I'm doing well, Preston. Thank you. I, anytime I get to preach of the scripture, you know it's my birthday. I don't know if I told you that. Ephesians 5, verse 6, and it says this, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Hmm. Wow. Do not be partners with them. Verse 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Can we just pause there for a second? That one, when I read this, man, that just hit me in the heart so hard. 
You know what my desire is? You might forget everything else that I preached today. In fact, I, I don't know. It might happen really quickly. I know. I know how it goes. Please don't forget this one line. Find out what pleases the Lord. Aileen, in your pursuit of Jesus, because I know you're going after him. Dave, I know you're going after him. In your pursuit as a couple, find out what pleases the Lord. If you forget everything else I say today, find out what pleases the Lord. Will you do that? That's good. That's good. I know I can trust you. Eric, find out what pleases the Lord. Will you do that? I know you will. If you don't remember anything else, at least this will get you on the right road. We're not focusing on ourselves. We're focusing on the king. What can I do that pleases you, Lord? That's what I want for my church. Verse 11, though, getting back to it, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. I think I can pause there again. Um, Jesus gave us the context for exposing darkness in John chapter 3. You remember what happens in John chapter 3? It's a really ironic time because there's this Pharisee who's a part of the, the important group of Pharisees, and he wants to meet with Jesus because he believes. He's saying, man, and nobody could do the things you're doing, Jesus, unless God was with him. But when does he want to meet with Jesus? Under the cover of darkness. <laughs> he's afraid of being seen with Jesus. And it's, to be fair, it's truly a danger. And you know what hasn't changed in 2,000 years? It's still dangerous to be seen with Jesus. People will look at you sideways sometimes. When they hear that you're a Christian and they start to assume things about you, and many of them true, sometimes it's dangerous to be seen with Jesus. Sometimes people want to hurt you. Sometimes they want to say things to you. Sometimes they want to pigeonhole you and put you in a box. This must be how you are. Still dangerous to be seen with Jesus. So John chapter 3, though, gives us the context of exposing darkness, and it's just ironic because here you have a Pharisee meeting with Jesus under the cover of darkness. Jesus tells Nicodemus that it's we who need to step into the light, that our personal darkness and sin would be exposed. This isn't about pointing fingers at everyone else. This is about starting at home. Dealing with me first, God. Deal with me first, God. Deal with me first, God. If you're getting annoyed with the culture around you and the, the breakdown of America, I am. Yeah, I get annoyed with it. But if you're getting annoyed with that and you're not addressing what's going on in your own home, what's going on in your own heart, you are a hypocrite. It was fun to try that and flip it around for once. I like that. Yeah, I, usually Christians get called the hypocrites and I, I'm just trying it out. You know, if you... <laughs> if you're so concerned about everyone else, but you're not addressing what's going on in your own heart. You are a hypocrite. And we don't like hypocrites, do we? John chapter 3 says we need to step into the light that our personal darkness would be exposed. And of course, in Ephesians 5, in that context, it also includes not ignoring someone who's close to you, who's been deceived by sin, they're trapped in it, they're living in it, don't ignore that person. Don't just say, well, that's nice. Somebody, uh, this, this is a real story, and I can't share all the details for <laughs> a lot of reasons, but somebody was telling me about a law that they broke last year. And it was a, a serious, egregious offense. And I was like, yeah, I think the police are probably going to be looking for you. <laughs> they're like, What? I don't know, but it's not that big of a deal. I'm like, no, I'm serious. Are you living like this? You're consistently doing this? The police are coming for you. You're going to get caught. You're going to get taken away from your family. You're going to put in jail. You're not going to be able to provide for them anymore. There could be more consequences. I warned my brother to stop. So don't ignore the people around you. Don't just say, oh, that's nice. Nice story. Wow, you're up to that, huh? Hmm. No, if you love these people, step into their life with them. Gain trust with them and speak life. Amen? Amen? You know, when I think about people who are caught in sin, I think most people end up defending their sin. And the way that they got there was the people close to them didn't really give them a timely out. So by, by the time they're neck deep in sin, they're like, it, it's too deep, I'm too far, I can't climb out of this. It's affected their identity. They think, well, this is just who I am now. Because the people around them didn't check in at a good time, early on when the struggle was real. They're still thinking about things when their heart wasn't set on it. 
at least that's, it seems to be the, the way I see so often in someone's life that they get set up against God is, is they've been doing it for a long time and nobody has stepped in to check on them. There was no accountability. There was no, hey, are you doing okay? I noticed this is going on. That's how people get wrapped up in it. And, and we know that when it comes to sin and our struggle, that salvation doesn't just fall out of your pocket one day. I want to make sure I'm clear about this. Some people have a perspective that, like, if I sin too many times, my salvation is going to fall out of my pocket, and I'm going to be like, shoot, God told me to hold on to that thing. Where did I put it? You know, uh, my, I'm, my salvation's gone. I sinned too much. Let's just straighten that out a little bit. First of all, a person who's intentionally living a life of sin is not saved by definition. They have not repented. They're saying, I want to keep living in sin. They're rejecting the good news of the gospel and the cross. So that person who openly says, I'm just going to keep living the old life, they're just not saved. They're not losing salvation. Their intellectual process isn't matching with their spiritual life and their actions. That person does not know the Lord. Okay? But now for the person who struggles with sin, um, you have to understand that your salvation doesn't just fall off one day. You're not just walking down the street and you're like, man, I cussed again, and now I'm not saved. It's not going to happen like that. But, and this is an important but, I do see a lot of scripture that compels me to understand that people who harden their hearts against God and choose to pursue sin, that has a corrosive effect on faith. Salvation is faith in God, trusting in God, right? 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 It was done through Jesus, but salvation is trust in God. And I see that sin has a corrosive relationship on faith. You can take a person who's doing well, and if they start to struggle with sin, it starts to eat at faith. And there's less and less and less faith to hold on to. And, and by the time they've embraced it, they, they've just rejected trusting God altogether, and they've lived a new life. They're doing their own thing, and God has no part in it. So I do see plenty of scripture that says a person can walk away from the Lord. I don't believe that the Lord is just looking and waiting for like, who can I take it away from? That's not what I believe at all. I don't think the scripture says anything like that. But I do see that there's a real danger and there's plenty of scripture that says people can make a decision to turn and walk away from Christ. How do they get there? How can a Christian get to that place? Well, I think sin being entertained in your life has a corrosive effect, and over time, it eats at your trust. I'm going to give a really harsh comparison of, of how this will make even more sense. Right now, pornography is so prevalent, and it's eating up so many relationships. Um, because of shame, it's not often listed as one of the reasons on divorce documents, but in a private study that I found online, um, it was listed as the number two reason for divorces in our country was pornography use. And when you look at what it does to the relationships in people's marriages, is pornography use over time corrosively eats away at the relationship because it's another relationship that's intruding on a genuine one. So sin is not a good relationship. We should not have that relationship with sin, but when we invite it into our life, it starts to eat away at what, if sh what should have been us and God in this faith relationship. And, and so I see this, this disgusting parallel between how pornography eats away at people's relationships and the way that sin eats away at our faith. Does that make sense, church? Yeah. All right, so even for a saved person, sin is still dangerous. Are, are you saved? Yes. If you trust in Jesus, you're saved. But sin is still dangerous. And, and Pastor Louis Giglio, uh, we did a small group study in our, our Young Life uh, group from, um, it was called Dead But Still Deadly. And this was a, an important concept. He talked about how snakes, we, who's glad we don't have like cottonmouth rattlers this far north, okay? Rarely, I know it happens sometimes, but rarely does it happen. One time I was in Grantsburg, just right over here, Grantsburg, and uh, on a missions trip, of course, you know, to save those horrible people. And... <laughs> And I was at the range, and I was laying down, I was shooting, and I didn't know this, but they have a giant snake that is local to the hills of Grantsburg that's huge, and it's yellow. And yeah, I know. And it has this diamond shape on it. And it's just a gopher snake that are normally black, but this one has like crossbred with some other devil, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> as I was shooting, I look, 
and this yellow snake comes out of the ground and is coming towards me. I'm like, oh no, it's happening. It's happening. The devil, away, you know. <laughs> I don't like snakes. I don't like the snakes a lot. Um, we don't really have, <laughs> we don't have rattlers very far north. Southern Minnesota, I think they have some. But Louis Giglio brings out a point that snakes, rattlesnakes, you can cut their head off and the mouth is still dangerous for a long time. In fact, it could be months. Snakes can be dangerous for months without the rest of their body. As long as there's poison in those fangs, they can still bite you. You could step on it and not see it. You could bite a, or step on a dead rattlesnake and it can still get you. And sin is kind of like that. Like you're a Christian, you're a believer, you're saved by the grace of God. But when you go looking for sin, and you go hunting for that, and you step on sin, man, it can still bite you, it can still hurt you, it can still wound you. And I think we all know that's true. We've played with a lion one or two times in our life, even as a Christian, and sin still hurt. So it's dead, but it's still deadly, Pastor Louis Giglio says, and I think that's a great analogy. Paul, in this passage, is making sure we don't play with sin, which eats away at faith. The next part of that, in this passage, it tells us not to become partners with them. Don't become partners with them. Them being people who are committed to being one foot in God's camp and one foot in the molasses of a sinful life. You guys ever watch those cartoons growing up and all the bad guys always fell into molasses? Did you ever notice that? You know, growing up, I thought I would find a lot more molasses, like people just had molasses in their house. That's not true. No. But, uh, but sin is kind of like molasses. Have you ever seen it, how goopy and thick it is? Sin is kind of like molasses, like it's really hard to get off of you and separate from. And so if you have one foot in God's camp and one foot in the molasses of sin, you're really slowed down and it's throwing you off and it's hard to escape. Paul's warning us to not have one foot in the molasses sinful life. Don't partner with them, he says. Scripture has spoken well to that point. Who is the them? Scripture says that bad company corrupts good character. I have seen people who are on fire. I mean, absolutely sold out. They gave their heart to the Lord. They're not selfish. They're committed to his kingdom, but got back in with old company, with bad company, with friends, who were uncommitted to the Lord, and they spent the majority of their time with that crew. And bad company corrupted good character. When uh, we talked to our friends at Teen Challenge, they, they tell us that the, um, the failure rate of somebody who comes through the program is, is going higher and higher. And I'm saying, why is it going higher and higher? Why are people going through Teen Challenge, coming out as believers, and then failing? It's because people are more and more consistently going to the same group of friends that they always had. They're moving right back into the same old town. They're going to that same group of friends and they're expecting that somehow it'll be different. But bad company corrupts good character. So do not partner with them, the scripture says. You understand that the scripture and Jesus is not full of hate and he's not like, yeah, they're the bad guys and we're the good guys. He's not trying to be mean. He's trying to protect you, church. When he says, do not partner with them. He's not saying they're the bad guys and we don't want them. No, they're the mission. People are the mission. We're called to love the people, but if you're spending the majority of your time with people who are not invested in the mission, bad company corrupts good character. It'll change you. If you spend all your time with COVID patients, the chances are you'll catch it too. If you spend a lot of time with people who are unfruitful and unrepentant, there's a strong contagion element to that. First, it's a way of thinking, and then it becomes a way of living. So I've told this story before a couple times, and I want to tell it one more time. When I was in college, uh, in, in Bible college, which was just a couple years ago, um, <laughs> when I was in Bible college, I had a professor at the school who was liberalizing, and I'm not talking about politics. I want you to hear me clearly. Spiritually liberalizing. His ideas, his, his thoughts about Jesus, he was liberalizing so hard, and, and you could see the coldness come over him. And this was a professor. Now, the way that this touched my life is my best friend was very close with this professor, and they were doing a lot of work together, and he was writing a lot of papers and doing research together with him. And they spent so much time together that it affected my friend. And, and before I knew it, in the time of a semester, just one semester, 
my friend, who is my best friend, had killed his relationship with God. He had, he had gone to a place of almost complete secularism in his thinking. And it was kind of private, but he still maintained that he wanted to have influence over people. And he was still trying to be a teacher. And I saw him around campus trying to teach groups of people bad, liberalized theology about Jesus. And this was like my best good friend, as Forrest Gump would say. My best good friend. And it, it really wasn't fun for me because I knew what had to happen. First, I had to look at my own life and I realized that my friend, this bad company, had started to corrupt good character. I knew what was right, I knew what was true, but some of his theology had started to taint the way I saw the world, the way I saw the scripture. And I had to deal with me first. And then I had to go to my friend and I had, I had to warn him. I had to tell him, I said, Let's say his name was, uh, oh man, there's so many names in this room, I don't want to use any of them. <laughs> Edward, Edward, there's no Edward here. Okay, good. I was, I'd be like, Edward, it's just kind of a funny name to use now. <laughs> I'd be like, Edward, uh, you're in danger, and if you continue down this path, we can't keep hanging out. It was so hard. I'm going to tell you that I lost one of the few best friends I've ever had in my life. I mean close, close, close friends. There is a cost associated with being a light bearer. And that is, what fellowship can light have with darkness? That's what the scripture says. I can't. And so I didn't throw him to the curb. I didn't say, you're worthless and you're, you're tainted and you're confused. I said, you're in danger. And I warned my friend. And my friend, in a very sober moment, told me, I like the things that I'm up to, though. I like the things that I'm doing. I like this way of life, and I'm not going to change. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep doing it. The love for God had been eaten away, and it was replaced with just intellectual conversations that were not fed well. And he became not a children of light, but a child of darkness, hurting the people around him. He became bad company. He was supposed to be the best man in my wedding. I mean, there's a real cost associated with following Jesus, amen? But it comes from a love. It doesn't come from a hate of people. It doesn't come from a, I'm better than you theology at all. You see, as I was about to get married, I realized I'm going before God. I'm going to have God unite my wife and me, and I've got my friends around, and this is a spiritual act, and I'm not going to make my best man a person who has turned his back on God. And I need to warn him carefully, and I need to show him that this is serious. And the last time that I talked to him, Edward, we'll say, the last time I talked to him, with tears in both of our eyes, I mean actual tears, man tears for the record, but with, <laughs> with tears in our eyes, we realized we're not going to be seeing each other anymore, we're not going to be hanging out anymore, we're not best buddies anymore, it's over. Broken hearted. It was not a joy for me, I didn't enjoy it. But I'll tell you one thing, I love God more than every single thing, every created being, a person, or, or a thought in this world. I love God above all. Amen. And I want to reflect him well. And it was a choice I needed to make. And you know where my friend is right now? Broken relationships, chaotic, confused. There is nothing that is good fruit in his life. And I've, re I've reviewed and I've assessed the decision I've made and how I went about it over and over again over the years. And I realized that God protected me. God blessed me. I felt like, it felt like discipline at the time because I didn't really want to do this. But God disciplines those whom he loves. He reproves those whom he loves. And so I want to tell you that you being a light bearer, it's important. You're a child of light. Don't give up on that. Be careful about the company that you keep. I'm not saying separate from all believers. I'm not saying if somebody's got really bad sin in their life that somehow you just got to be on the other, the other aisle now. No, I'm saying amongst the body, we need to discern and be careful of those who's named a believer, who claim to follow Jesus. Are we helping them deceive themselves or are we encouraging them into the light? Amen. That's what we need to do. We have to fight for people, but we can't partner with evil. We're inviting other people into the light. We're not stepping back into the darkness to make someone more comfortable in their rebellion 
How many times I've heard somebody say, well, Jesus would be in the bars with people. That's where he would be. Tony likes that. (laughs) You've heard that before? I've heard people say that. So if Jesus were here, he'd be in the bars. And you know what he'd be doing in the bars? He'd be calling people to repentance. This is what we saw in the New Testament. Jesus hung out with, what, tax collectors? What did he do to them? Called them to repentance. Prostitutes, what did he do to them? Called them to repentance. Jesus made disciples. He didn't step backward into darkness and say, well, just feel comfortable right where you're at. He invited people into the light. So the scripture says, be imitators of God. What do you think you should do? Call people to repentance. Be gentle, be cautious, be slow, be understanding, be patient with people. But that is your role in a dark world. Call people into the light. And LHCC, get yourself some godly, light-bearing friends. That's important. Uh, verse 12, as we're wrapping up here, go to, go to verse 12. And here's what it says at verse 12. It's shameful to even mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes light. That's why it said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because these days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Can I get an amen for that? Be filled with the Spirit, LHCC, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Ron, you never sing to me anymore. I don't know. (laughs) I know that's kind of a goofy context thing when it says sing to one another with songs and and hymns and all that kind of thing. But you're getting the essence of what the culture was in the early church. Is there was an optimistic, positive, light-bearing attitude. They wanted the focus to be on the resurrection, not the darkness. And that's what I want for my church. I want us to be light-bearers. Um... I'm going to have to stop there just for the sake of time. Would you stand to your feet with me and I'm going to close up with this thought.